The following podcast is offered freely through the Insight Meditation Community of Washington and by Jonathan Faust. To learn more or to make a donation to support this work, please go to www.jonathanfaust.com. So two weeks ago, I talked about how in the different forms of spirituality, there's sort of the, the monastic path, the, the internalized path, and then kind of the householder path of living in the world and your commitments and responsibilities and, and just how different those two paths are. They, they're equal in many ways. But I ran across this great quote that summarizes one of these paths really well. You maybe you've heard this one. Do not walk behind me, for I may not lead. Do not walk ahead of me, for I may not follow. Do not walk beside me either. Just pretty much leave me alone. <laughs> so tonight's talk is more about the relational field. It's more about the, the practice of who we are in relationship with each other. It's about the art of listening. My mother told me I was never a good listener. I think that's what she said. I think that the, uh, it's been said that some of the most successful people in the world are the best communicators. And truly, to be a good communicator also means that you develop a capacity to listen. So what I'd like to talk about tonight are really kind of four parts. Uh, the first part is kind of the consequence of not listening, uh, the failure to listen to yourself and to others and to talk a little bit about the art of listening to listening to others as a practice, as a spiritual practice. And the art of listening to yourself. And how the very practice of listening can be a practice of liberation. The failure to listen, I think we're all familiar with, but there's a, there's a great story that uh, kind of summarizes that. It's the story of this uh, two parents with a with a young child bring their daughter into a diner, and they're they're kind of harried. And the the waitress comes over and and says to the uh, to the little girl, um, "Well, what what do you have, hon?" And she said, "I'll have a hot dog and a coke." And the father says, "No, she won't." She's going to have meatloaf, and she's going to have a glass of milk, and she's going to have the house salad. And the waitress looked at the little girl and said, so what do you want on that hot dog? <laughs> the parents were stunned, and the, the waitress left. And the little girl turned to her father and said, she thinks I'm real. One of the greatest wounds we have as children is not being seen and not being heard. Perhaps when you think back to your earliest times of feeling alone or not being gotten as a child, we're all around that, that mechanism of not being seen, not being heard, not being listened to. And what that, what that does is it sets in what's called one of the first, the first kleshas. And the, the kleshia is the sense of something is wrong. It's how we formulate an idea of who we are as a separate identity, a belief that there's something wrong with me. And out of that, we develop a strategy for survival and that also oftentimes becomes a strategy for success. But on some level, we shut down around that belief that I'm separate. No one, no one gets me. And in that sort of closed quality, that closed self-protective mechanism, something shuts down 
in terms of how we listen to ourselves and our capacity to listen to others because we, we develop an identity and we begin to protect that sense of identity. One of the most interesting things where we fail, where we fail to, to listen to each other is we're not really clear what we're even talking about. Oftentimes, you're having a conversation about two different things. There's this great line that says, I know that you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. <laughs> I love that line. We become so, so self-centered that we, we don't take in what the other person is saying. Or we're waiting for the other person to finish so that, we can, so that we can speak. And in that same way, we shut down on our own inner knowing. We shut down on our own, our own dreams, our own sense of what's possible through that sort of self-editing, self-censoring mechanism that's based on the sense of not being enough. So it's helpful to notice that failure, because out of that failure to listen to self and listen to others comes a tremendous amount of stress and dissatisfaction and suffering. And the essence of it is a form of delusion, that, that I am separate. That's that, that first klesha, I'm a separate being. And sort of how the kleshas work is, first you believe that you're separate, and then you start looking for evidence that supports that. And then you develop a list of what you like and what you don't like, and that list gets longer and longer and longer, where you have a smaller and smaller amount of bandwidth. And the final klesha is the fear of death. Because if you've invested so much of your life force into the sense of a separate self, and that goes away when you die, that fear of death can be very, very powerful and very gripping. So when we, when we begin to pause and really listen to the moment and listen to ourselves, there can be a tremendous healing that occurs. Different parts of us can begin to, to come back home again. That's a little bit of what I'd like to talk about. This last week, I was uh, on vacation with, uh, with family, and we had a, a dinner guest whose, whose wife had, had died recently. So we invited him over, and, uh, um, and he's a really fascinating guy. Uh, works for a huge law firm, represents corporations, and so forth. And I wasn't sure what, what we'd have in common as we were talking. But as we were having conversation over dinner, it turned out that um, he was from Indiana and he got into politics through his representative in Indiana and that's what brought him to DC. And, but he worked on a farm when he was a kid and so did I. And suddenly we had this whole conversation around, around baling hay in the summer when you're a kid. And it became this, uh, it was very powerful for both of us to be able to talk about something that we had in common, that we didn't know we had in common before, of what it's like to work in a haymow and what it's like to, to lift bales that weigh more than you and what's, what it's like to work with the, the older kids and be part of a team in the summer and getting in the hay before, before it rains and that intensity and just that, the, the sense of commonality. I ran across a very interesting quote that, that talks about, about conscious listening, because it was such a surprise and such a delight to have this, for both of us to have this shared experience. It went on, we both worked on hog farms, and it was a really fun evening from my point of view. But here's what this woman says. Now, before going to a party, I just tell myself to listen with affection to anyone who talks to me to be in their shoes when they talk, to try to know them without my mind pressing against theirs, 
or arguing or changing the subject. No, my attitude is, tell me more. This person is showing me his soul. It is a little dry and meager and full of grinding talk just now, but presently he will begin to think, not just automatically to talk. He will show his true self. Then he will be wonderfully alive. And for me, in this conversation with this man who's deep in grief, very, very deep in grief, to be able to describe the, the aliveness and the joy of those childhood experiences and to, to resonate that was such a powerful bonding experience. We tend to like people who are like us. And when we, when we can drop into deep listening, we can allow our commonality to come forward. But it takes some skill. It's so easy to find ourselves pushing our own agenda. Someone said sarcastically, thanks for listening to my problems and somehow making it all about you. <laughs> Maybe you've had those conversations in the past. I remember once I was in a conflict with my wife and there was some intimation that I had done something that was part of our conflict. And uh, so we, we decided to do a, a kind of a listening exercise where one person just speaks and you're not responding. I may have shared this story before, but she was, so she's, she went first. And as she was just, just speaking without interruption, in kind of a free flow style, you, you begin each phrase with the words, I am aware of, and you just name what's there. And o over the course of her, of her speaking, she, she talked about her hurt, she talked about what I did, she talked about what I reminded her of, and, and as I was listening, in my mind, I was aware my mind was going, I can explain that, you're wrong about that, here's my rebuttal to that. I had my little yellow legal pad just going all the way through. And then at the end, she said, I feel completely clear, and I have no need to talk about this anymore. <laughs> and I thought, well, wait a minute. I've got my, <laughs> this like this 14-point bulletin of rebuttal. But it was such a powerful insight, because I thought, is it this easy? It isn't, but sometimes it is. Just listening. We have such a need to be heard. So there's something about, about the power of listening to others and what a gift it is. When I can, when, I, when I'm present in listening, I really try to do a role reversal and just sense, what is this person needing right now? What is this person wanting? What is this person hoping for? And I love that shift beyond just my point of view, but really actively including another person's point of view. There's a very powerful and very simple way to cultivate empathic listening. If you ever listen to Terry Gross uh, from Fresh Air or Tammy Simon uh, through uh, Sounds True, they are masterful listeners. And, and it's, it's pretty simple. It's really the art of clarifying questions. And the questions always begin with what and how. Well, what was that like for you? Well, how did that feel? Those two simple questions, the clarifying questions, have a way of, of eliciting a deeper sense of intimacy that can be quite powerful. Here's a little bit on, on non-fixing listening from Brenda Uland. Who are the people, for example, to whom you go for advice? Not to the hard, practical ones who can tell you exactly what to do, but to the listeners. 
that is the kindest, least censorious, least bossy people you know. It is because by pouring out your problem to them, you then know what to do about it yourself. You know, I have come to think listening is love. That's what it really is. So when we can listen, when we can really listen to others, we begin to heal the divide between ourselves and the other. And of course, there are all kinds of blocks to listening. We can experience just overwhelm, compassion fatigue of just too much information. That makes it really, really tough. Here's what Rachel Naomi Remen says about, about listening. I suspect that the most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen. Just listen. Perhaps the most important thing that we ever give each other is our attention, and especially if it's given from the heart. When people are talking, there's no need to do anything but receive them. Just take them in. Listen to what they're saying. Care about it. Most times caring about it is even more important than understanding it. Most of us don't value ourselves or our love enough to know this. It has taken me a long time to believe in the power of simply saying, I'm so sorry or someone, someone is in pain and meaning it. One of my patients told me that when she tried to tell her story, people often, often interrupted her to tell her that they once had something just like that happen to them. Suddenly her pain became a story about themselves. Eventually she stopped talking to most people. It was just too lonely. We connect through listening when we interrupt what someone is saying, to let them know that we understand, we move the focus of attention to ourselves. When we listen, they know we care. Many people with cancer talk about the relief of just having someone to just listen. Have you ever had that experience where, where there's something unsettled in your life, something kind of coming up, to the surface, you don't know quite what it is. And then there's that sense of, how do I be with this? I, oftentimes there's sort of that thought, I need, maybe I need to talk to a counselor, I need to talk to a therapist, I need to talk to someone to help me figure this out. And that's a valuable thing. But what I've noticed for myself quite often is, what I really need is someone to listen someone to hold the space so that I can articulate what's there and sense what's below the line of what I'm aware of and what I'm not aware of. So my own, my own sense of intuition, my own sense of inner wisdom can, can recognize it and name it and find a way to be with it. That's the power of, of what we can do through active empathic listening. Here's what Carl Rogers said about, about the, this practice of empathic listening. This kind of sensitive, active listening is exceedingly rare in our lives. We think we listen, but very rarely do we listen with real understanding with true empathy. A listening of this very special kind is one of the most potent forces for change that I know. For me, that's quite powerful. And I feel just as the deepest wounds that children have have to do with not being seen and not being heard. And they're absolutely active in our adult life as well. And to offer someone the gift of non-fixing listening 
is a powerful, not only a powerful gift, but a very, a really powerful practice. And of course, part of meditation, part of mindfulness is about honing your ability to listen to yourself. Mahatma Gandhi says, God speaks to us every day. We just don't know how to listen. There was someone not too long ago who, who shared with me that they were just overwhelmed by a sense of, a sense of sadness and, uh, and some real depression in his life. And he had struggled really hard to overcome it, you know, through all the best practices, you know, through exercise and diet and, and trying to get in touch with what was, what was underneath it and working it hard and doing different medications and trying those. But, but at this period of in his life, he was dealing with all of the hindrances, you know, strong aversion and judgment, self-blame, always fantasizing, planning about something better, constant anxiety, and a kind of ruthless criticism. And he decided to try a meditation retreat in one of our kind of classic Vipassana retreats, you know, seven days of silence, of sitting and walking and sitting and walking. He wanted to take away all the distractions and just practice what it meant to be present in the here and now without judgment to the best of his ability. And if you've gone on an intensive retreat, you know, you know that they are filled with the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. And the first six and a half days were the 10,000 sorrows <laughs> for him, where he just sat with the despair and stayed with the, the anger underneath that despair. So much of this practice is about coming into relationship with reality. That's pretty much it. And what he realized, that the truth in his experience was that his life wasn't working that the dream job that he had worked his whole life for was actually not a dream, it was more of a nightmare. It was no longer a match for him. He was terrified of dropping the job, but at the same time he was terrified of what it would mean to, to let go into the unknown. And he came away with the realization that he, he, he could not do that job anymore. He knew in his heart that he had to let it go. It's been said that there are, there are three sources of fear, that if you feel fear or anxiety, and when you really examine it and be with it, that you can get a sense of, of the tendrils of those fears, that they're, either they come from a sense of survival you know, like a real, real deep-seated survival fear. Or it'll be about a fear of losing control. Or it's tied into a fear of losing attention, affection, or love. And as he sat with that, he realized it was all three. Just completely on fire for him. Just, uh, you know, the fear of losing income the fear of being out of control, what it, what it meant in relationship with his family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's no, no happy, happy ending to that story. But what he came away with was a deeper sense of what was true for him. There's no immediate resolution to his situation other than knowing that he could not continue with what he was doing. And it takes incredible courage to, to practice with sincerity because it means that you are deeply listening to yourself. When you sit in meditation, there is a very profound listening 
the essential questions again and again. What is my experience right now? Can I be with this? This practice cultivates wisdom, recognizing what's true, not your story, your embellishment, but what's actually true, and increasing your capacity to allow, to stay present to that. So stepping into a meditation practice is stepping into a very, very deep practice of listening. There's kind of a, a level of practice, which I mentioned before, the, what I call my maintenance practice, what I can do on a daily basis that keeps me at some sense of equilibrium. And then there's the transformational aspect of practice which can be quite, quite profound. On a, a month-long retreat I did, again in, this, in the Vipassana, sitting, walking, sitting, walking. And in the third week, there was someone who stood up during one of the question and answer periods, and, and he said, I'm, I said, I'm just wondering, does anyone else here wish you had taken the blue pill? <laughs> 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 that when you begin to practice, there is oftentimes sort of the, the rush of homecoming. And then that can sometimes be followed by a recognition of how out of balance that you are and what's required to bring yourself back into balance. What's unhealed comes to the surface. What's needing to be seen and felt comes to the surface. For me, as I've been practicing these, these decades, I think I'm beginning to come to terms with how neurotic my mind really is, you know, just how shameless my mind really is. And also getting how, how much my life is driven by what are called the eight worldly winds, by the, the desire for pleasure and the fear of pain, the desire for success and the fear of failure, the desire for fame and the fear of blame, and the desire for happiness and the fear of despair. And I, I deeply honor the, the courage to practice, because what practice reveals is just how intimately your life is run by those eight worldly winds, and how it's possible to cultivate equanimity and to cultivate wisdom and compassion in the midst of the turmoil of this wild life that we're living. Oftentimes when, when you engage into practice with real sincerity, there can be a, a, a time of deconstruction of recognizing habits that you have that are no longer as healthy or life-supporting as they were before. You begin to explore certain assumptions and beliefs that you've been holding that you begin to, as you slow down and listen and examine those beliefs, get to really inquire, is this really true, what I'm believing? Part of the, the inner, the practice of inner listening includes this sense of what's between me and feeling free? What's between me and feeling happy? And bringing the fullness of your investigation to examine that, that's a natural part of the process. It's sort of a, a deconstruction of the self. But there's another element of this inner listening which is about asking, what lights me up? What, what do I love? What am I grateful for? If I could be successful at anything, what would I choose to do? When you're 102 years old, looking back over your life, 
What will you most cherish? What will you most remember? So that inner listening is not only attending to what needs to be healed, but it's also attending to what's calling you forward. So then there's the practice of listening itself. I'd like to lead a little meditation on this. I find that, that, that listening meditation can be a profound way of training your attention to, to the present moment. Ram Dass famously said, the quieter you are, the more you can hear. So there's a quality of, of quieting yourself so, so still that you can hear everything that's present. There are practices about doing which involve concentration and focus and observing and investigating. And then there are practices of being, of truly resting in presence. And sound meditation can be a very powerful way to, to open into this. Here's what a Chinese philosopher, Huang Tzu, says. The hearing that is only in the ears is one thing. The hearing of the understanding is another. But the hearing of the spirit is not limited to any one faculty, to the ear or to the mind. Hence it demands the emptiness of all the faculties. And when all the faculties are empty, then the whole being listens. There is then a direct grasp of what is right there before that can never be heard with the ear or understood with the mind. So if you like, you can close your eyes and we'll do a little exploration of, of listening meditation. Sound meditation can be a a powerful way to identify these three characteristics of reality. And you might begin by just letting your awareness open to this field of sound vibration around you. And as you bring your concentration to the experience of sound vibration, you might reflect on the first quality of reality, the first characteristic. In Pali, it's referred to as anicca, or impermanence. And over this next minute, just simply notice everything in the realm of sound that is changing. And the second characteristic is referred to as dukkha, which has to do with the quality of dissatisfaction or unsteadiness or stress or suffering. And it is in direct relationship to grasping and pushing away. And you might notice over the next minute or two, with the quality of sound, 
Is it possible to just let it be without grasping or holding on or pushing away? The third quality or characteristic of reality is referred to as anatta, roughly translated as not-self. As you notice the sound vibrations, the experience of sound, notice how impersonal they are. They're happening all by themselves. Noticing what is changing. Noticing how as you allow the sounds to be, there can be a quality of inner freedom. And allowing the sounds to flow without any effort or struggle. In these remaining minutes, we'll explore what is called bare attention. As you notice the sounds around you, it's the experience of sound without past, without future. And with the sound of the bamboo flute, noticing the sound as well as the space the shape between the sounds.
And notice the quality of sound, the quality of presence, and notice what is changing. And if just for a moment, sense what it's like to let it be and to let it flow. And as you're ready, you can deepen the breath just a little bit. And when you're ready, you can let your eyes open or you can remain with them closed. So this art of listening is about connecting. As you practice listening to the self through meditation, you are inevitably listening to the parts that are calling to be healed, but you're also listening to to that still, small voice of intuition that's calling you forward, that's guiding you. And as you practice listening to others as a spiritual practice, it can be a powerful way to connect, to see self and other and other in self. And the practice of listening itself in any given moment, you can pause and open to, to the sounds and notice how you're holding them and just let them be. It can be just a, a moment or a minute or more as a way of opening into the mystery of what it means to be in one of these portable flesh units. So thank you for your, your kind listening. Um, I'm happy to announce that we are breaking the cookie fast. So there, there are cookies and, and tea in the back. Um, if you do connect with someone, you might try those clarifying questions, the what and the how questions, and see what that's like. If you'd like to be on the mailing list and you're not, you can sign up in the back. As always, thank you for your generous support for the church and for me and uh, for IMCW. Have a wonderful evening, and um, I'll see you next week. Thank you again.